Frank. Frank, mind it, man. Can I Be Frank is all about capturing real, authentic, unedited conversation. Probably. And I was sitting with this guy who was pretty, he was a seasoned smoker and he was telling me some pretty horrific stories. Yeah. And, I had, and I had just seen um, Fight Club. Right. Okay. Yeah, I never really got that movie, to be honest. Well, uh, what I saw in Fight Club, I, I started in my, I started thinking that I was having a conversation with myself and that okay. I was the one right. that had gone through the horrific so experience. Sort of, sort of some like psychosis. It's totally that, yeah. Okay, you're smoking too much weed, too much white to get seaweed. Yeah, probably. And he was seaweed. I think we smoked three and I had canned. I was young, lad. Like, right. And I had tins at the same time. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to get you to grab that. Just put this in as well. I might not even refer to Yeah, there's no harm in having there if, if, if you need it there. a name of something or a project yeah. or a programmer or something, I could just grab it. There you go. Thank you. I'll just keep it down here, maybe. There you go. Grab that there. Where do we put this? Uh, maybe in the middle of your chest there, Dan. Yeah, from there. There? It's your voice. Go, ah, 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 ah. Actually, hold it there again. We'll get you to do that again. You can do something. Just see what the peak is like on it. Okay. Go for it there. La, 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 la. La, 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 la. That's beautiful, isn't okay. it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have my water here as well. So what I was saying to you was that experience... Um, so basically the problem with it was I smoked there was maybe three joints smoked and God three joints is a lot and there was alcohol too yeah which apparently you shouldn't mix but anyway in that moment in time I was convinced that he he, he wasn't there and I was in a room talking to myself yeah and I found it fucking terrifying that was I denying was I lying to myself about the experience that I had uh, and it, it whatever it, it's interesting the impact of that that stayed with me for a long time mm. and that it was that yeah, fear of afraid I'd say yeah of going mad oh yeah definitely. yeah and then that I think that was the Scary. biggest fear with any of the ones that I would, uh, would have taken was am I going to lose my mind I know but when that passes there's yeah. a bit of a relaxation into it then sure you know um, so um, how, how do we start like is, are you already recording? We're starting. Yeah, start. okay, we started. <laughs> cool. I do that every time. Yeah, I okay. find I find it funny. Sorry. So, and this is where we sit. Like we sit like this. Do I look at you or do I look at the camera? Well, to be honest with you, it's it, it, I, sometimes um, if somebody. I find it awkward if I sometimes have to go like that and look at somebody. Mm. So whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay. Um, Alrighty. Uh, and so you, we've got two sounds going on. This one's recording, and right. we've got this one recording. And yeah, we have a backup of that one there. Right. Um, so, do you want me to introduce myself? Well, or? so uh, I suppose there's an interesting question. Like, how would you introduce yourself? Because obviously, you do an awful lot of things. So, how would you introduce yourself? Um, have you got an elevator pitch? If somebody says yeah. in a party, I fucking hate that. I was only talking to that about De with Declan. Yeah, well, I would normally say, uh, well, my name is Brian Duggan. I um, teach computer science in the Dublin Institute of Technology. Okay. I'm um, also the AI developer for a VR project called uh, Deep. And I do kind of VR projects and creative coding projects in my spare time. And then also, I make this other project called TunePal, which is a music retrieval system for Irish trad. Okay. So like that's a sort of like that's my sort of professional. Profile. That's what you do. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. what I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's very. Um, that's a lot. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, my life is pretty rich. Yeah. Mm. And do you do, you um, do you love it all? Or I mean, if you had all the money in the world, would you go and would you keep doing what you're doing, or would you drop any of them? You probably can't say. No, no. I wouldn't drop any of them. To would be honest not? with you, no. Okay. I, I love teaching. 
Yeah. Uh, I really enjoy teaching. I mean, it gives me great pleasure. Um, I'm very lucky in DIT that I uh, only teach things that I enjoy teaching, which are all programming subjects. Yeah. Uh, I really love the interaction with my students, uh, teaching a lot of creative coding. Great thing about teaching in DIT is that you have a lot of autonomy. So uh -huh. like I've sort of developed this program, this course called Object Oriented Programming, but basically I teach a lot of creative coding. Yeah. I'm always trying to get my students to get into the flow state and I talk to them about flow states and you know, getting lost in the project, whatever you're working on. But that, but that, I, that happens, else, so. does, how does that happen for, um, some people can just get lost in stuff. Yeah. Can, uh, for other people, do you think it's possible for people, for other people, for everybody to get lost in a project? Um, has to I be think a bit it of passion is. There. Yeah, I think there has to be a bit of passion. But I, well, okay, so this is not really psychedelic related. I suppose it is to the extent that a flow state is another altered state of consciousness. Yeah. So the stuff I'm trying to teach, I um, mean, you know, I teach by means of this sort of technique called creative coding. So yeah. creative coding is the idea that you can use code like an art medium. So you yeah. can use it to express your thoughts and you can mm -hmm. use it to make beautiful things. Yeah. Uh, I find also you don't need to know everything with creative coding. You just start the project and you kind of learn things as you need in order to complete the thing that you're working on. Mm. Um, also, I try and get my students to make toys. So for example, this semester, my students are working on making um, user interfaces for sci-fi devices. So okay. this is how they learn the principles of object-oriented programming. Mm. So they're doing like warp drives, engine systems, weapon systems, and I try and get them to pick a sci-fi movie that they like, pick some really incredible looking user interface, and then they try and develop it themselves. So you make this it playful. Code process. That's what you're doing. You're taking, exactly. the, yeah, you're exactly. taking the, yeah. the one and zeros out of it and putting pictures on coding almost. Yes, yeah, that's okay. exactly that's, right. That's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Um, and so you mentioned AI. Yeah. Obviously AI, especially in the world of business or whatever, everybody wants to be the first with AI. But do you, uh, have you followed, do you follow Elon Musk? What do you think of this idea of uh, of the, the machines taken over. Singularity and things like that. I'm yeah. personally very skeptical about it. Yeah. I think we're probably quite a long way from having computers that, you know, are able to have the depth of human experience that an actual living person has. Mm. Um, I think probably within, you know, maybe 20 years, we'll have computers which can, you know, appear to be alive to some degree in that they're going to be very good at understanding human speech they'll be very good at like doing sort of customer service type yeah. jobs where you know there's a limited uh, range of dialogue but i'm very skeptical about this idea of the singularity and things i think to be what honest like singularity singularity um you know the singularity is the idea that i think it's like by something like 2029 the computer will have reached the same level of intelligence as a human being and we'll be able to download our consciousness into machines and stuff like that. Mm. Very skeptical about that because, again, I think like we're embodied in our physical beings, you know, uh, we're not just our minds, you yeah. know, we're actually our physical bodies as well. So like unless until we can do that and I, don't, I actually Would you live forever if you could. What's that? Would you live forever if you could? Um, maybe I'm going to anyway. So yeah. I'll take my chances, I think. Cool. Would I live that? forever? Probably, yeah. Somebody, I mean, asked, me that question, really good, somebody yeah. asked me that question, would I, um, if there was a pill that meant mm. you could live forever, would you take it? Jeez, that's a tough question. I never really thought about it, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah, my instant reaction was no. Which Why? Um, I was probably fucking wrecked at the time from the kids, yeah, but there I, there you was go. that feeling <laughs> of... When it's done, it's done, you know, and and, yeah. and, the, and the idea that it's this or this forever and ever and ever. It's like, um, yeah, yeah, maybe the eternity thing seems like this idea in, um, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen Curb Your Enthusiasm and uh, Larry is getting married to his wife and they're making their vows and she goes, when we go to heaven, we're going to be together forever <laughs> and ever right. and ever and ever. And he kind of goes, ah. Oh, we might be single in heaven. <laughs> so it's just that idea of it, um, the idea of eternity in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, and, sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think if life is good, yeah, when life is good, I think, yeah, probably I might take the pill. But then, yeah, life is not always <laughs> no, what Rosie. you want it to be. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So like, you are a fucking really interesting guy in terms of the stuff. It's not. Thank you. It's not regular. Let's say. For somebody who's a lecturer in a college teaching computing, mm. then to be making a, a virtual reality 
game inspired by psychedelics. So I, it's it's I, I, um, and obviously you've all, there's entrepreneurial side to you too that you're setting up the app and things like that. Uh, but how do you kind of how, how did you end up here today uh, without trying to be too linear about it? Sure. But obviously you studied computing and then obviously had an experience in some way, shape or form down the line about psychedelics. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's lots of different things I could maybe talk about in terms of my life and what brought me to here. But I guess when I was a child, my dad bought me this computer called an MSX. And right. the MSX computer didn't have very many games for it. So you ended up having to type in programs for magazines and stuff. Okay. And so when I was quite young, I developed this love of coding. Right. And um, then eventually, uh, you know, like skipping loads of so different things. So how young things. was this now? What's you, that? How young are you talking about? Uh, this would have been 1983, I think. Uh, and and yeah. It's okay to ask your age. So I'm 45 now. 45, yeah. 1983. So what are you talking there? I can't do the math very quickly. But uh, so I'd have been 11 at the 11. time. 11, okay, so you're yeah. young, obviously intelligent. Yeah. Well, I, no, I would say probably of average intelligence, you know, I did kind mm. of okay and well, even certain. But yeah. I really liked coding. I just kind of really enjoyed this idea. And I remember actually when I was a kid. A certain type of intelligence then. Really yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I was fascinated by the idea of kind of machine intelligence yeah. and embodiment. So I remember this program called Danny that I wrote when I was, uh, well, actually, I got it from a magazine. And it was a little uh, like a, an interactive agent that you could type things to yeah. and it would analyze your text and then it would be able to come up with like conversations and stuff. But most okay. of the conversations were nonsense. Yeah. But it was kind of fascinating to me that you could have a computer that was able to talk back to you. you yeah, know? okay. Yeah. So that's, I think that was one of the things that kind of inspired me about computer science. When eventually I, um, let's see, loads of other things happened. I mean, when I did my undergraduate project, it was all about music because I played trad. Yeah. This was uh, 1993. So eventually then I ended up teaching computer science in DIT, having worked in the software industry for various years and doing mm. really unmotivating jobs. Eventually I decided when I was going to teach in DIT that I was only going to try and teach the stuff that was going to be inspiring, motivating, and to try and convey to students this kind of passion and this love for code that yeah. I feel uh, you know, has been a great thing in my life as yeah, well. Yeah, I think anybody with a bit of a passion, any lecturer, yeah. teacher, or whatever, has passion for something, it just has to impact the kids. Well, I hope so, yeah. And yeah. um, I think like maybe sort of like to bring it all forward, you know, about two years ago, I joined the Psychedelic Society of Ireland. I had mm. had a few psychedelic experiences about 20 years ago when I was a student. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'd been kind of interested in, you know, the sort of like what, what happens to the human brain and also like these um, mystical experiences that yeah. can happen, you know, um, these sort of... So then I joined the Psychedelic Society. I ended up meeting loads of really cool people and then mm. having a lot of interesting psychedelic journeys over the last few years. Yeah. I mean, there's two projects that I'm kind of currently working so it was, on. So it was yeah. much, it was, um, and we, I, I will get to your projects, I suppose, yeah. I'm just trying to get uh, in behind it. They, they, I, you, it was a long, uh, that's a long gap. You're in your 40s now. So yeah, it's sure. It seems myself that you start kind of uh, re-experimenting yeah. in a way. Yeah. What, what drove that, do you think? God, I actually don't know. I mean, yeah. what was it? I don't know. I think I just saw on Facebook, um, Psychedelic Supper, which was my friend Kira Sherlock, was organizing yeah. these psychedelic suppers. And I just said, yeah, I'll go along. Shout out to Kira. You know, I had done a good bit of clubbing, I guess, maybe about 10 years ago and had had like experiences with ecstasy and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then like actually even more than 10 years ago, like that would have been in my 20s. Mm. And then nothing really for a long period. And then I guess just my curiosity was piqued by these psychedelic suppers. And then I went to the psychedelic suppers and then suddenly started interacting with all these amazing people. Yeah. I remember the first psychedelic supper uh, was a fundraiser to raise money for MDMA, right? To buy like a kilo of MDMA or an ounce or whatever it was right. for these uh, MDMA print. assisted psychotherapy <laughs> studies that were going on in the UK. Yeah. I remember at the time <clears throat> being astonished. Like I just couldn't believe that this was actually happening. Yeah. And subsequently in the last couple of years, <clears throat> Of course, I've learned that, you know, there's the studies in Imperial College London and mm. also in St. John Hopkins, you know, and MDMA is likely to become like, you know, a psychedelic that is used therapeutically for post-traumatic stress. Disorder. Yeah, it's already yeah, approved, FDA approved, apparently, uh, or yeah, approved sure. to continue more research. It's like, like phase three clinical trials. Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned, like I stumbled upon, I was always looking at Kickstarter campaigns, mm. and this is what I put in the video, that I... I uh, I stumbed upon a Kickstarter campaign for MDMA and psilocybin. Yeah. I was going, 
why are you talking yeah, about what the fuck? Like, this yeah definitely yeah this isn't real is it yeah you know and then i actually talked i went uh, i chatted to kira on skype mm. and started finding out a little bit more about it and she was a fountain of knowledge in terms of the the research that was happening that's what yeah. i found stunning the research definitely i mean there's like there's there's a psychedelic science and there's breaking convention sure. psychedelic science in particular you know you see a lot of studies i mean there's the example use of ayahuasca for post-traumatic stress and the use uh you know for addiction therapy yeah you know so and it's interesting these substances are being reevaluated, and mm. like as you say you know they're illegal substances like since you know, the 70s were told that these things, you should stay away from them. You know, they cause psychosis. Um, basically, you know, drink alcohol and drink coffee, smoke cigarettes instead. These are the ones which are, you know, sanctioned by society. But actually, um, these substances have been used safely by in human cultures for thousands of years. Yeah. yeah, and even if you consider like psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms, you know, magic mushrooms are the, like the mushroom, the use of mushrooms in human culture is thousands, tens of thousands of years old, maybe yeah. hundreds of thousands of years old. Yeah. Because it predates, you know, for mushrooms, you don't need to, there's no cooking involved. Like you can basically just eat them and you get the effect up from them, you know? Yeah, they're grown. Yeah. yeah but can, you're, you're very positive, obviously, about psychedelics. What, like, I am, I, I would be cautious. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would put big, I mean, it's not for everybody. It's, and yeah, I would I say, uh, like my, I've had experiences, um, and they, even if there was a, was a shaman there with ayahuasca, yeah, you know, I vomited for six hours. Yeah. So I think it might be just some fucking for six hours. Si wow. I, I vomited throughout it. This but was now, a ayahuasca still, ceremony. It, 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 yeah. Wow. No, but it was still probably one of the most amazing experiences ever. But I still mm. vomited. Yeah. Uh, for six hours and I went through through well, it's like, it's like other people uh, well, oh, oh yeah I did like a yeah. challenging experience yeah. but all the same it wasn't it wasn't it was still quite gentle despite yeah. that but I suppose what I'm saying is this is these are phenomenal chemicals and can cause unbelievable reactions in the mm. body and it is very much handled with care isn't it yeah. really you know you i think i think i agree and i think people are right to be cautious about them m mainly because just there's a lack of understanding about how to use them in mm. the correct way you know uh we're not really told you know how to take in fact there's no real education about how to take um psychedelics or plant medicines or any other form of drugs we're not told this in school you know we're maybe given sex education in school but this thing, well, which is like... I don't know where you went to school. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Mine was pretty basic. <laughs> yeah, but I think there's just basically a lack of a lack of understanding about how to take them safely and therapeutically. Yeah. And also... So therapeutically is it, though, Therapeutically. Isn't it? Therapeutically is one aspect well, of Well, I suppose it. there yeah. is the exploration. Yeah. There is, definitely. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, somebody asked me recently uh, at a talk I was giving in uh, Cologne, you know, and I had given this talk and I was talking about all these amazing experiences I've had and somebody afterwards said, like, why would you want to take a psychedelic, you know? This yeah. was a person who I felt was very connected to uh, what uh, Timothy Leary would call game consciousness. So he was a guy who was really invested in thinking and talking and working and basically this reality. Yeah. Okay, so why would you want to take a psychedelic? Yeah, why would you, yeah. So for me, the the motivation is curiosity. I think that the, is, these, these are, mis you know, you can have mystical experiences. You can, like, I want to live my life to its full potential. And I yeah. want to experience the full range of experience that my being is capable of experiencing. Yeah. And, and anything that's not going to hurt. I, I, think, I think that is amazing though, but in yeah. the sense that I, in a way that's, that's the reason that's a big reason for in the sense if that curiosity it comes out of a place of not really a hundred percent comfortable with this reality and when Maybe. i hear I, I, there's some other potential reality some other possibility that was for me it was that when i heard about ayahuasca yeah. i heard about just an alternative view and i, I thought mm. And likewise with LSD. I, I didn't like the idea that I was scared of LSD, so that's why I approached LSD. Right. But uh, what I'm saying is, um, uh, it, I think there's a, some sort of innate curiosity. Forget, yeah. the, forget the psychedelics at the moment. Totally. You, you probably would be looking into some sort of spiritual books. 
you're not going to be convinced of what the priest is saying down the road. You know, there's sure. that kind of question and, there's, uh, and there isn't answers. Perhaps, know. and I, I'd also say maybe it's the same curiosity that leads people to go to church uh, and to, well, to see need, the maybe. mystical in life. Yeah, you know? maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true, yeah. Um, but, that's the, but it's more, um, it's safe though, isn't it? It's, um, Psychedelics are pretty safe though. Safe? Well, uh, for me, my, you see, everybody's experience is different. For me, mm. you're, you're totally confronted with yourself. It was no, for me, mystical really, to me, like right. it was all... What about the, really vision, the visionary aspect? You know? I had some amazing, yeah. amazing visionary, but what I took away from them all was kind of like, this is, here's your little lesson, uh, you know, and, the, yeah. and it more or less it filtered from each element or from each one. The, 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 the message was the same about friends, right. family, yeah. relationship, the basics. Yeah, people often get that message. People often get a loving message from their psychedelic experience. Yeah. I mean, and again, you know, not to say that it's always a, a blissful, happy experience for everybody. Yeah. Um, psychedelic experiences can be challenging, particularly if a person, like I say, is very attached to um, what Ter uh, Terence, uh, Timothy Leary would call game consciousness. You know, if you're yeah. really connected to your ego and your sense of self, it can be very hard to let go and just let the experience wash over yeah. you and let the experience happen. Yeah. And I think, I suppose, maybe that's... I think Kira would talk about um, scene and setting. I mean... The, Set and setting, yeah. yeah. I think that's... It probably is everything if you're in a safe place. There's exactly, no point yeah. walking down on O'Connell Street and yeah. sitting in the middle of O'Connell Street and taking or something. E even we say people, you know, that might take um, LSD at a festival or something like that mm. and then they just find that the experience is overwhelming. Yeah. So they, you know, but interestingly, um, say, you know, I maybe give an example of Kalindi Lee, right? So Kalindi Lee is a martial artist from Detroit mm. and Kalindi Lee takes mega doses of mushrooms. So yeah. Terence McKenna's heroic dose is five dried grams and Kalindi yeah. Lee takes between like up to 20 to 60 dried grams of magic mushrooms. And what's happening there though in that experience? Yeah so it's really interesting what he talks about. What he talks about is connecting with the info particle realm. So his idea is that consciousness kind of shrinks when you take a psychedelic right? Your consciousness shrinks and shrinks. The info particle realm that he talks about is below the Planck's constant length and he says that, that at that below the Planck's constant length you can see if you like, and he refers, you know, he uses this, I don't know if it's metaphorical or literal, but he talks about being able to see the programming, you know, being able to see the servers that are generating this reality and the programming that generates this reality. Yeah, now that's a bit mental, is it not? That, so, well, I mean, there is loads of things that this is a, uh, we, uh, Elon Musk, which I had the idea in my head even, but Elon yeah. Musk talks about that if computers develop the way it, uh, they should develop and with the same so sort of growth that we've seen in the last 50 years, mm. that it wouldn't be uh, unreasonable that in a thousand, two thousand, whatever number of years, that mm. reality like this could be recreated. Perhaps, yeah. Um, and this is one of those that we're sitting in a program I don't with some know. kids' iPad. I, I, yeah, like, I, I used to think, I used to be curious about that idea, but I think it's a sort of a, I think it's pointless. It doesn't get you anywhere. No. Maybe if this is a simulation, it, like this is, this is still me and you're still you. We're still sitting here. Yeah. Simulation or not simulation. It doesn't make any difference. I think it's, it's a purely theory. intellectual it's a story. argument. But it's what you, what you were saying there though about the servers mm. in the background, in a way, that's almost born in my mind because the word server is mentioned sure. there. It's born out of you know being here because you'd imagine that if the, the, the server thing wouldn't even exist if something like this was possible to create. Uh, I think it, it'd be something totally different. I think it's perhaps just the fact that this is you know the early twenty first century servers and programming are things that we understand now. Like if he was having this experience fifty years ago, he might he might have used different words to describe the thing that he's experiencing. Mm. Yes. Okay, but so he's still saying that that he he can see coding and behind the scenes. Yeah. I don't think. I, again, I'm not too sure if he means it literally or metaphorically. Okay. You know, but he has. What was I going to say? The reason why I brought that up was because Kalindi Ali again, he talks about how safe psilocybin is. Right. Mm. I mean, when people have challenging experiences with psychedelics, they're challenging to their sense of self, and they're challenging to like. I guess they're challenging in their mind, but they're not physically—they're not physically going to hurt you. 
Yeah. You know, psilocybin. There's that's even, where you need somebody like you or somebody that's there to guide you maybe, through yeah. the process. Somebody who's going to uh, help you that what you're experiencing there. Yeah. That, you know, the way you're terrified. Or there the way, like, just, I mean, I've had scary experiences as well. I remember, you know, la- it was only, was it last year or the year before? The year before, um, you know, I'd gone mushroom picking with friends and I had had you know, maybe take an acid over the summer, some great experiences. I've had this experience with toad medicine. I felt myself to be kind of getting experienced with psychedelics. And I decided I was gonna have three and a half grams of dried mushrooms, right? So three and a half grams of dried Irish mushrooms is equivalent to the Terence McKenna heroic dose because the Irish mushrooms are the strongest in the world. Okay. And to be honest, it was too much for me. At that stage of, of my life, uh, you know, everything was pixelated. I couldn't use my phone. Um, and I had this really weird, I was lying on my beanbag and I was listening to um, this drone music, which normally I find very calming and comforting. And I had this vision of the afterlife open up in front of me and I could see all of these souls from the next life and they all looked blissfully happy. Yeah. And then there was this woman who was flying t- towards me and she was like, come with me, come with me. And uh, I thought, wow, this is amazing. But I felt my breathing slowing down, you know, and I felt that what she was telling me was that I had to die, you know, and I had to stop breathing. Now, this this was just like my mind then immediately went into, oh my God, I'm going to die here. And um, I freaked out, you know, and yeah. I got really overwhelmed by the experience. And I had to go and call friends basically to like help me through the last of this experience. Okay. I feel with more experience now and knowing that I wasn't going to die, like you can't die, basically you won't. You yeah. know, what will happen is the the um, psilocybin is like acts on your serotonin receptors in your brain and your body just processes it out after a few hours very more more efficiently than the body can process a lot of things including alcohol and coffee yeah you know you have coffee you might feel it a few hours later or you have a like four or five points you're going to feel it the next day yeah. if you take a big dose of psilocybin you're going to be fine after a few hours because your yeah. body just processes it out it's completely natural yeah. and it's an analog of something that your brain is producing any, anyway which is a, a, a neurotransmitter mm. so i would have been fine but i just didn't realize it yeah, but I suppose in a way, for me anyway, uh, it's why I, I can understand why there's rituals in place. Yeah, or I can understand the logic and why, you know, you have a guardian or a shaman or wh- why it's why that's recommended. Now, obviously, yeah. I, like I'm the type who would be, I like the solitary. Yeah. And I, even if I'm terrified, I kind of, that, that seems to pass. I kind of know whatever mm-hmm. it is that's going to pass. But... Um, yeah, I still think it's. Uh, I mean, I know we're talking about it here, but it's it's still a it's a handle with care. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I yeah. mean, um, and, and you know, we're talking. Anything. You're talking about having a shaman or a guide. Like, there are cultures in in the world, like for example, in Peru, where they have uh, like five thousand years of uh, ceremonial use of ayahuasca. You know, yeah. and they have shamans and. and you know, it's it's that's very much a part. That's in, that's a that's a part of their culture, and they have developed these rituals around the use of this very strong psychedelic. Mm. There's an interesting book, uh, Aldous Huxley's *The Island*. I don't know if you've ever read it. No. So he he wrote two books, right? Well, he actually wrote many books, but there are two books which are interesting. There's obviously *Brave New World*, which is this dystopian one, yeah. future, right? And the island is a utopia, right? So this is basically an island where um, the, the the psychedelic is called Moshka medicine, and everybody takes Moshka medicine. Mm. They take it anytime you feel stressed or anytime you basically need to be reminded of the other. You know, people take this Moshka medicine, and they have a culture developed. In fact, a lot of the book is describing how the society is organized, mm. and it's a really interesting book to read. You know, because like that's how psychedelics can be incorporated into society and society maybe for the better you know so, yeah 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 well I, to me it's i think some people are uh, adventurers and are curious and yeah. some people um are not and yeah. may and do and you know i think some people might go I, like i know some people just go yeah i don't really give a shit like yeah. about this. whereas and i heard about you know people can have three in, in a therapeutic environment people can have a couple of doses of psilocybin and be depression free yeah i find that kind of just going right well that's that's pretty mesmerizing it is for definitely. anybody who is really I, suffering and if you're suffering you're more than likely lacking if you're really really in the depths you're lacking something and so yeah. if this can bring in to me it's kind of like and it's i've almost experienced this idea of you know your the synapses 
mm. and the movements and say you have a loop of thought or a way of being and it's this way and I, you know you go to work and you do this and you do that and you and this is the way it is and you like steak and you like uh, all of these things and it's really a straight line sure straight thing. line you feel like your identity is fixed it's fixed Mm. The psychedelic will come in and blow that apart. Yeah. And when it comes back together again, it's never quite the same, those yeah, those movements. Definitely. And and that is a fucking good thing. But because we're so invested, I think, in this in yourself yeah. and, and who you are and everything you believe, that why would I ever fucking want that to be shaken? Like don't fucking take don't take that away from me, man. <sighs> yeah, I, I think I, like, again, if you're happy with that. Fuck, yeah, for me it comes comes back, comes back to curiosity. You know, yeah. Terence McKenna often talks about like if a UFO landed outside and yeah. aliens were there and you could go and talk to them. I think most people would be curious to go out and see what they look yeah. like. You know, and so other people would be there. <laughs> well, perhaps, but I think I, I think at least everyone would be would want to know about it, you yeah. know. And 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 there's this substance called DMT, yeah. which is you know one of the strongest psychedelics, and it's abundant in nature. Yeah. You know, it's in orange peels and bananas. You can go up to the uh, the, the plants in the Phoenix Park, and you can smell the DMT off them. Yeah. You know, your body uh, uh, there's 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 a theory that your body produces it endogenously mm. and DMT when it's smoked or vaporized produces the most intense and astonishing psychedelic experiences which are very short duration they're like five to ten minutes and, and you really get to experience the other people talk about traveling to different dimensions people talk about contact with non-human entities yeah and what do, uh, what do you know about writing. that what's that what do you know about that so I've, 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 I've been very fortunate to uh, like have you know, there's a type of DMT, it's sprayed onto a herb, it's called chonga, and you okay. can smoke it. And uh, so I've, I've smoked chonga a few times, and also I vaporized uh, DMT as well. And yeah, every time, it's astonishing. You know, the very first time um, I smoked chonga uh, with my friend uh, Ronan, who was like just a sitter for me, um, you know, within like, as soon as you exhale the chonga, uh, I felt like I was getting, um, a, there was a spirit that was praying over me, you know, in right. a language that I didn't understand. And the next thing, I felt my face become wet as I received what's called an Agua de Florida ceremony. So Agua de Florida is this um, sort of like a perfume that the shaman often like sort of like sprays into your face during the ayahuasca experience. Yeah. And then the next thing, the room kind of dissolves. I felt like I was in something that looked like a circus tent and there was these non-human entities everywhere. Um, and that was my first experience. After that, I can't remember much of it, but I remember it being hyper real. In yeah. other words, more real and more intensely saturated colors and everything than this reality. And does it feel like uh, um, an alternate dimension? Is that, uh, yeah. That's other people's words. It felt I don't like, know it felt like tuning the TV, you're tuning my consciousness into a different channel. Yeah. I mean, again, like just the same experience. Later on, I tried uh, the, the same changa and I tried closing my eyes and lying back. And that was even more incredible. Because immediately I was in this white room and there were these half white human entities and uh, they were dancing around me. So I often see these dancing half white human entities and ha like half white, like dwarf. half the height of human, uh, like of, of us. Okay. And their clothes were all covered in writing, and they even showed me lots of pages with writing on it. And it was in this font that I didn't recognize, but I have seen it in some of the visionary artwork. And could of you Alice feel and Gray. Like, could it? Could you feel like? No, you, you, you I don't feel like I could touch them. You know, okay. but I was definitely in a different place. You know, I was in what looked like to me a different room or a building which was all, all white, but apart from these really colorful non-human entities who kept showing me these pages with writing on it. It's in a way, describing describe personal psychedelic experience, unfortunately, sometimes there are like somebody, you're hearing somebody else's dreams. You sure. Just, you, can't, you can't go there in your yeah, mind. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's foreign, and so it's... it's well, what, what, what is interesting, and maybe this will help like, connect you, but what happens during, you know, how this whole thing, the ceremony sort of like works is, you vaporize the changa, uh, put the pipe down, and then you're gone. Okay, so you're gone for about five to ten minutes into mm. this different perception of some other reality or whatever. And then after that, then the room just kind of like comes sort of back comes together back again. together again. Okay. Yeah, and then you're like, oh my god, what was that? I'm curious. That so that's it. DMT, <laughs> and people, you know, on higher doses of DMT, often talk about traveling to different dimensions. It's very interdimensional, yeah. and this experience with non-human entities is a very common phenomenon. Mm. You know, there yeah, was, it uh, you know, it's, it's worth looking at that uh, the movie, the, the DMT, the spirit molecule, uh, which is that, about yeah. Rick Strassman's experiments in the middle of the nineties. Yeah. So these were 
you know experiments carried out by uh, you know in a sort of a scientific setting mm. and um, they basically gave DMT to lots of different people and then lots of people report these kind of interdimensional experiences and yeah that was the most common theme entities. of it you know, some was terrifying but some of the yeah most sure were the most but like it, most it, it is quite ter- I mean I would say terrifying it's quite intense because when you're there you're wondering oh my god I'm gonna come back I want to come back you know it's yeah. like overwhelwhelming you want to and come then back you c- yeah. It, yeah. it's just the, the actual fear that you're gonna be lost yeah, you know, and then you come back after like five minutes. You're like, oh my god, what was that? Because there's no way back. Does it feel like that? You know, that uh, you might, des- or there's somewhere you know I'm, I'm going to go back, or because if you're in somewhere totally different, yeah, surely you get that sense of right. You know, there's a foreignness. Like there's a foreignness to the experience. You feel like, mm-hmm. I, as I say, it's like your consciousness is a TV, and you tune your consciousness into a different into a different channel for the duration of the experience. Yeah. So that's DMT, and DMT, like, like I say, is abundant in nature, and it's in lots of different plants. Well, I, very I, easily extracted. I've always had this. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the thought, "What if this is the DMT mm. experience, and you haven't come back?" And Who then the, the end of it, it's <gasps> holy yeah. fuck! I'm not doing that again. I know, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, there's the Chinese philosopher uh, Huang Zi, like who has the thing about the butterfly. Yeah. You know, a man dreamed he was a butterfly, and when he woke, he wondered, was he a man dreaming he was a butterfly, or was he a butterfly who's now dreaming he's a man? Interesting. You'd have to repeat that around three times to me yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> so like, imagine, imagine it's a man who dreams, he, was, he dreamt he was a butterfly, and then he woke up. Yeah. And then he wondered, is he a man who had a dream that he was a butterfly, or is he actually a butterfly who's now dreaming he's a man? Oh God. So I think virtual yeah. reality has the same effect uh, to, to, to that extent. I remember the first time I tried the roller coaster experience on the DK1, and uh, it's it's so interesting because you take the VR headset off, and then you wonder, okay, maybe I'm still wearing a VR headset. Maybe I'm a brain in a jar somewhere, and my reality has been fabricated in a computer program. It's that real. It, it, it makes it? you. It's not necessarily that real, but it does cause you to question the, the nature of reality to that extent. Is that, in a way, is that that could be linked to your flow? Or say you go to the cinema. The reason I'm saying that is yeah. you go to the cinema and there is a moment, and I absolutely adore the hmm. moment, when the movie ends and you come outside and it kind of is the world, you're so immersed and lost in that movie. It's kind of like the world, it doesn't come back together and it's not comparable to what you're talking about there. Yeah. But there is that feeling. And then it's like when you're, if you're in work and you're doing something that you're lost in, Mm. you are lost there's only the work really. sure yeah i think something like v uh, vr and maybe psychedelic experience as well because it has that visionary aspect mm. it, it's even more intense than that you know because like i say there's you're experiencing a different reality for for you know for the for the journey and it's experience. radically different um well i'd say like the psychedelic experience the psychedelic experiences can be radically different Mm. definitely and then something like vr i mean these are constructed realities made by programmers and artists yeah so you know a lot of them a lot of vr experiences are just games you know but like some of them there is a whole sort of like genre of your experiences which to some degree they're like tripping toys or they're trying to replicate aspects of the psychedelic experience and is that then what is that what has drove you in a way to create these games they're trying to trying to bring to life some yeah. of the, the experiences that you've had or not no I, no I'd say well okay so maybe there's two projects and I'll just briefly talk about them mm. uh, so one of the projects that I work on is called deep right and mm. it was actually created by my great friend and colleague Owen Harris okay. and I would say that that has psychedelic aspects to it but it's mm. not really inspired by the psychedelic experience apart wow. from the fact that some of the aesthetic of the experience um, has qualities like this harmonic quality, you know, this sort of like oozing and undulating quality because it's set in this fantasy underwater environment. The other aspect of the psychedelic experience that maybe gets conveyed through that is the um, stilling of the mind. And the reason why Deep does that is because it's a breathing, breathing meditation. Yeah, I thought yeah. that was very so interesting. You wear a breathing sensor. Yeah. And I think, you know, this distinguishes it maybe from uh, other VR projects that are just a vision, that are just an aesthetic. Yeah. You know, and the, the aim of this, and it's very calming, you know, mm. it's, it's, and it also has a therapeutic application as well. So that's the psychedelic aspect yeah, of that. Yeah, I just told that for one second because I might forget it. Like yeah. I, I, there was a, a Kickstarter campaign from an Irish company that tried to create the business didn't go anywhere in the mm. end, but they basically had this little thing, and it, it was supposed to fit inside your pocket this size. 
and it was connected to a game. Hmm. So, uh, it, it, you, so you looked at the game, which was quite peaceful, and the calmer you were, the faster the, the, you yeah, were winning the race. Right. Or you were Is doing it Relax to Win? I think it's maybe that project, or there's, there's other projects. No, it's not. I'll send you on the link. But yeah. I think where you're, uh, keep going anyway, because I think to be able to use yeah. technology as a form of meditation or calming, which might help anxiety or whatever, yeah. I, I think that's done in the right way is fascinating yeah i mean so this is like a biofeedback thing you know yeah. so the the experience that we created it's like it feels a bit like deep sea diving and right. the idea is to try and it's to try and get you to do yoga style breathing so breathing deep into the diaphragm yeah and amazingly it, it actually works you know you mm. do deep for, for like 15 minutes experience people often come out and they, they're quite emotional after it like just the level of um, stilling of the mind that occurs, you know, yeah. and also it's really beautiful. I mean, it's a really beautiful experience. Yeah. The other project that I'm working and you on. You did. What have you? Yeah. You're the architect. You're the designer. No, you're no. The I, I programmed the AI for the creatures. Okay. So there's a whale. What does that mean now? In my, I programmed yeah. the AI for the creatures. So there's obviously you. You go on. What does that mean in my language? So there's schools of fish. There's um, schools of uh, creatures that look like manta rays. We have dolphins, and there's also a giant whale. So basically, I program the animations and the behaviors of those creatures. Okay. So, so the movements. The movements, exactly. The way the fins and the tentacles, and you know, I have other projects that have t that have tentacle creatures in it. Yeah. But all of that stuff, I, I basically program that. So hopefully, they they're inspired by real creatures, and hopefully, mm. you get the sense that even though they're they're hyper real, they're VR, they're 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 stylized. Yeah. But hopefully, you get the sense that they're that they're living creatures. Yeah. You know? So how do you get? How do you? You must watch a lot of yeah to get the sense of the movement. Ah, oh, that's interesting because I started out looking at um, nature documentaries and yeah. YouTube videos of schools of fish and whales and dolphins. And eventually, I, I stopped looking at them and basically I do it all by feeling. Yeah. Okay. So if I have a 3D model to animate, um, I just basically keep on doing it and tweaking it and changing it until it looks like it's it, it's a real creature. It Our creatures right. are inspired by real creatures, but they don't necessarily look like whales yeah. would typically look like. You know, our whales yeah. have like lots of extra fins, and. Um, you know, they're sort of like they're stylized creatures. Yeah, okay. The other project I was gonna talk about, and it's because maybe this is a bit more inspired by psychedelics, is called mm. Infinite Forms. Right. And this is almost a spin-off project of Deep, right? So mm. I found, um, I wanted to make this framework where I could test animations without necessarily having to have uh, 3D models, right? Mm. So I'm not an artist, I'm a programmer. And so I, I, I started developing this project, right? Where basically I would animate cubes and spheres and dodecahedrons and things like that to try and make right. them look like real creatures. Okay. And so I developed this project and I found that I was actually just getting completely lost in this um, world that I was making of these creatures. Yeah. So um, I developed the project, kept on working on it. And like basically I decided that I was just gonna go into the project. Whatever ideas I had, I was gonna try and do them. Yeah. So this project now is quite psychedelically inspired mm -hmm. in the sense that psychedelic means mind manifesting. So all of this project is basically a manifestation of um, the ideas that I had, you know? Mm. And I feel that VR has this potential. It has the potential to allow people to basically create the realities that they imagine in their minds, yeah. you know? And that's what this project is all about. So you can, for example, this is now, I feel it's a sort of a journeying project. Um, and it's really, in my opinion, it's quite beautiful. It has a lovely um, psychedelic aesthetic to the colors. Um, everything is generated procedurally from code. Mm. And you can travel infinitely in this world. It's called Infinite Forms. And you'll always see something new. <clears throat> um, you know, and hopefully you'll always see something beautiful. I want to get to get the sense that it's like almost a nature documentary. You can just Does sit it, and look at it and you can just go, oh, wow, look at that. There's a PlayStation game whereby, yeah, you're, uh, with Alan Watts. Uh, the, yeah, and basically that's everything, you can, yeah. You can be... Amazing you can, project. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't, I, I got it from my kids and then I thought, actually, some of the language yeah. is a bit too deep, nearly almost. Um, because uh, he really talks about the human condition is when you hear that in the voiceover but <clears throat> yeah, yeah i think it's you can see a plant and then you you be the plant exactly it's, it's all yeah, that no way. so my project has it like shares as, uh, shares characteristics with that project okay because in my project you can become certain creatures as well 
Yeah. So um, Terence McKenna got to try VR in the early 90s before he died mm. and he wrote about it in the Archaic Revival and he said that in VR we can become whatever we want, we can become our thoughts. Mm. So inspired by that, I also he said he wanted to be an octopus mm. because an octopus basically embodies or you know, um, it doesn't have language. Mm. The octopus basically expresses its thoughts through its movements and through the color patterns on its body. Mm. So in my experience, you can become an octopus and you can have your physical movements then become the octopus's tentacles movements. So I was showing this in Berlin and people really loved it. You yeah. know? Also like, just just lots of kind of cool stuff in it. You can go for a ride. I have this big creature that looks sort of like a manatee or a whale or something. It's made I'd out be of able to show just to, I'd be able to show some You can show some, yeah, some screenshots yeah, and yeah, maybe some yeah. videos. Some yeah. videos, just yeah, it'll make it more. Yeah, but you um, can actually enter into like, there's these clear dodecahedrons on some of my creatures and then you end up your physical movement then basically becomes the creature's movements mm. as well. So this is inspired by Terence McKenna, you know? Yeah, and what, do, what would you hope that um, uh, you know when somebody's going through these experience they're putting it on like what when you see them take it off what do you look what, what makes you happy when they oh like, my god it is such an incredible feeling to mm. see people's reactions when they do something that you've made yeah this is another thing i think about vr which in a way kind of parallels the psychedelic experience mm. in that vr for me has kind of awoken me to this sort of creative aspect to myself that I mm. didn't really know was there. Like yeah. I have coded really complicated things, but then making things in VR and then looking at them and experiencing like the wonder of, 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 of looking at a thing that you've made that's beautiful. Mm. Like I find myself often in tears. Really? Yeah, definitely. Wow. I can remember a 13 hour coding a uh, marathon session, we were getting ready a build of deep for um, a festival in London. Yeah. And these 3D models were arriving all weekend and I was animating them, you know? And at the end I made this video and I had all the fish just swimming around it. And I remember just watching it over and over again with tears running down my face. Oh, that's so Just the cool. feeling that like this had come out of me. This yeah. was actually a, an aspect of myself I didn't realize I had before. So yeah. it, that's, that's the thing about psychedelics. I think psychedelics can awaken people to aspects of their true nature. Yeah. And I feel this, this creative thing for me in VR has awakened me to this aspect of my nature, which is this ability to make beautiful things. Yeah, it's a real, it's expression. Yeah, almost. It has to, um, It's an outpouring. It sounds like a bit of an outpouring. Was that, how long is the VR projects going on? Are they, how long have you been? Uh, I'm just trying to see was there a, is there a parallel between your creative expression oh, and the psychedelic sure um, I think well I started programming VR stuff in 2012 okay but that was because I wanted to teach a lot of the VR technology so I made this thing called BGE which was a game engine in C++ that okay. supported VR um, but a lot of my demos in those days were kind of what I would call tech demos apart from interestingly I made a project at a game jam uh, with my friend Alessa Baker mm. and we called it the power of the mushroom and this was like the mushroom could be a reference to like the Mario mushroom or okay, psychedelic yeah, like mushrooms yeah. and in this experience um, you start out in a classroom you have to first of all navigate to find this mushroom when you find the mushroom the walls fall down and you gain the ability to fly Right. And you fly actually with your physical movements. So we use the connect to, to, to track your physical movements. And then basically you use your arms to fly around like Superman through this environment collecting okay. mushrooms, you know? Okay. So uh, it's interesting that that's sort of like foreshadowed or for whatever, you know, foreshadowed like my later sort of psychedelic journeys and my, you know, meeting with people from the psychedelic society and that by like a good yeah. few years. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> when you join the dots backwards, yeah, exactly. Said yeah, somewhere. so there's a narrative there that I wasn't aware of at the time. Yeah, okay, and but so, do, but do you think then um, the, the the love you have now when you talk about uh, seeing these things mm. come to life? Yeah, what that was that there ten years ago? This urgency of want to get that expression out, or it was, but in different ways. Um, you know, like I, I have this other project called Tune Pal, which is mm. this music retrieval system for Irish trad. Mm. Like, so I play the flute, and I've been playing the flute all my probably most of my uh, life since I was a okay, young boy. It's there anyway, yeah. So yeah. it's there, yeah. yeah. And I guess I was just always interested in like trying to apply sort of uh, computer science to 
things that were passionate for me in other aspects of my life. Yeah, okay. So, but yeah. it was already there when you talk about. Yeah, it's so not just coding; it's creative coding. It's yeah. creative coding. There's a guy called Bill Joy who is the chief scientist with Sun Microsystems, mm-hmm. and he writes about. Uh, he was the guy who wrote a lot of the tools that are part of the Unix operating system. Mm. So he has this book and he refers to the Agony and the Ecstasy, which is the book about uh, Michelangelo. Okay. And Michelangelo would describe how um, he would have an idea for something that he wanted to sculpt, but he would say that like he would stay up for days and days working on this because he felt like that the sculpture was actually inside the rock and all he was doing was just freeing it. And yeah. so Bill Joyce talks the same thing about coding, you know, that he would feel like the idea was there and he just like all he was doing was like giving the idea, like, it, you know, manifesting the idea in this yeah. reality. It's, so that's, that's kind of the way I feel about code. You know, when I wrote TunePal, I had this idea that you could play a tune and recognize the tune. Right. So mm. and then I knew how I was going to do it. And I felt like I just had to do it. Like I just it had to it had to come out. The idea was there and it had to be made. Yeah. So well, you see, I think that's just that. That is, it's not just that is the artist's expression. Yeah. That that spontaneously comes out by yeah. itself. It's it's like it getting, has to come. It's getting lost in a book or editing something. It's just you, when it's done, it's done as mm-hmm. well. You kind of know that in your body when it's done, it's done, and it you keep going. You might work through the night, and and really you're just moving, 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 and it's all happening. And yeah. that's that's the flow in a way yes, as well. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that pouring out. Mm. Yeah, and I think that is in a way where we're all well for some. That expression uh, is where we're at our happiest when that is coming pouring yeah, out. Yeah, definitely. I feel my life facilitates me to be able to do this kind of work. A lot of people have kids, and you know, very demanding jobs mm. but I mean I'm lucky to work in a job that I love and also to be able to teach mm. the thing that I love which is coding you know yeah. so like I'm kind of I'm kind of fortunate as well and then I also get like you know long summers and good breaks over Christmas so I have yeah. I have headspace to give to these things that a lot of people don't have in their lives yeah that's true yeah mm. yeah it's nice very nice yeah um, I was going to ask you something that I don't know if you can uh, answer. So my kids adore video games. Yeah. Um, in two or three years' time, are they going to have the headsets on? And I'm just oh. going to, they're going to be gone like forever. I, I don't necessarily mind that when they're teenagers if they want to spend. But is do you think it'll become um, so secondary VR? It's uh, so, so such a, a huge part of life in every way. Do you think? Mm, I think you know there's uh, I think it'll probably just become better and cheaper and the headsets will become lighter you know there's definitely going to be a progression with the technology and the immersion um I wouldn't be worried about it though no I mean I think like cinema when cinema started people thought okay well people are just or even tv or Elvis or whatever (laughs) yeah yeah yeah. these things come you know these things come and become part of human culture and Mm. we just get used to them you know like Mm. the smartphone Okay, maybe people use their smartphones too much now, but yeah, I use mine too much. Yeah, mm. I don't really have any concerns. You know, I don't. Yeah, I don't have a concern that people are going to sit in the rooms. I'm sure some people probably will probably use the technology more than is probably healthy for them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Yeah. Um, have you read Ready Player One? No, I haven't. A uh, really interesting book. Yeah, and what then Steven it? Spielberg is making a movie about it now. It's a basically a, it's a book all about VR. You know. Uh, yeah. There's. Let me see if I can kind of summarize. Yeah, there's a, a world called Oasis, which basically everybody does everything in. And this is a sort of dystopian future, you know, mm. where it, like there's a limited amount of resources in the world. Um, it's a really interesting book, you know. Uh, yeah, Steven Spielberg is making a movie about it right now. So it's one possible the future what, what, for what, VR. And what would happen to what, like, what would What would that world be? Can you, is there a, a, like... Oh, yeah, it's not a particularly nice world. Um, but, yeah, yeah the, the, what you call it, the VR world sounds really cool because it's, again, the idea that you can become anything. Yeah. People go to school in VR. People do everything in VR in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. There's an image of... Um, and I'm not scared of it or fucking. I mean, what's the point of being scared? In it? But yeah. it's it, uh, so. There's a picture of Mark Zuckerberg in a room. Oh yeah, 
and he, everybody in the room has got the goggles on except him and yeah. it's, it's just it has an <laughs> ear, you've seen that one yeah, I've it's seen an that eerie figure. sort of feeling it is definitely yeah yeah, yeah. But it doesn't fucking matter, sure, if you're happy tipping away in that world. What what does it matter? Like, if Yeah, you're I don't think too deeply about it. Like, to be honest, no. I'm too... I don't either. No, I'm too kind of, like, for me, anyway, I'm, I, have too, I have too many things going on in my present life at the moment mm. to think too deeply about, like, what does it all mean? Yeah. The same even for psychedelic experiences, mm. you know. There's a lot of people, like, there's a lot of discussion on, say, the various different Facebook groups as to what these non-human entities are. Are they real? Are they not real? Are they yeah. just, you know, Timothy Leary says, everything you experience in the psychedelic experience is just created by your mind. Mm. You know, it's not real. Uh, or, like, whatever real means. But I don't know. I don't know what any of these experiences mean. Yeah. Um, I'm just, like, I think the experience itself is... Is a, is a worthy experience and it's worth having for for a lot of people i think that's the fucking key though in a way mm. it's 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 it might be a mind-blowing experience it yeah. might be amazing it might be whatever it is but it's just an experience like exactly yeah that's it like here's the thing you know people they're they're, they're people want to do uh like a skydive yeah or they want exactly. to it's yeah the they want they want to do these like you know people want to do these extreme sports and stuff yeah like uh, these are psychedelics typically are safer than a lot of extreme sports you know yeah uh, but they provide these like mystical experiences for people which can really yeah like i say open people up to aspects of reality or aspects of their own nature that they weren't previously aware of you think that i i'm definitely say in my early 40s i would have thought okay I've seen everything now I've done it like I'm, I'm bored of life you know yeah. what's, what is there now yeah. and uh, then I had this experience with uh, toad medicine which is the 5-MeO DMT yeah. uh, containing venom of the Sonoran desert toad mm. uh, you know in a ceremony in Wexford and like that really I we- have Wex- to say, Wexford County Brazil yeah we- sorry I should say Wexford <laughs> County Brazil Wexford County Brazil yeah yeah um, <laughs> You know, and that's an astonishing experience. Like, I, I, I can't really put that into words, you know, but that yeah. was... that Can was you an, try, um, just for a moment, just out of curiosity, when you say you can't put it into words, what, um, what words would you use? Okay, so like... Maybe I it have, is enough to say you can't put it into words. No, I'll tell you, maybe I'll talk, I'll talk about a second experience with toad medicine I had, which mm. was at uh, Azora at a festival in Hungary this summer yeah. with a facilitator called... Um, uh, Octavio Retting and oh, you can look Octavio time, up yeah. on YouTube there's lots yeah. of videos of the toad experience and Octavio's ceremony is really beautiful so you stand with your arms outstretched facing the sun mm. and Octavio basically plays a rattle during your experience and also sings these um, I guess they're like Icaros you know yeah these Mexican sort of like spiritual songs but you you basically inhale from the the pipe right Okay. The pipe is basically the dried venom of the Sonoran Desert Toad. Right. And uh, by the time you exhale, um, in my experience, what it does is it basically just powers through your brain. You know, uh, the serotonin, which is your default mode network, you know, your brain is full of this stuff, which is like a serotonin analog. Okay. And uh, the experience of it is astonishing. You know, like it's, it's for me, it's just like a kaleidoscope of colors, an incredible feeling of emotion and bliss, you know, that you can't really... Um, okay. You know, it's 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 beyond. It's 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 something that you feel is beyond the, the limits of of what you normally feel your your limit of experience is. Yeah. And afterwards, I remember, and this is all I can really say about it because it's very hard to put the experience into words. Um, people talk about non-duality, right? For mm. me, I don't know if I could even put that experience into words apart from to say that it felt like my whole life had led up to the having that experience it felt mm. like every breath I'd taken every sexual act that I'd ever had like mm. all my energy everything just expressed itself in this one transcendental experience that I had in Azora mm. and afterwards you know because you start to come back after the experience and I just collapsed onto the grass and tears of gratitude mm. for having had this experience yeah, you know, wow. like jumping out of an airplane is nothing compared to the experience of have you jumped out of an airplane i haven't but yeah, i mean okay. i would say like the you know there's lots of human experiences which are very intense but this is the probably the most intense thing you're ever going to experience yeah i've jumped out of an airplane have you? I, I, but i haven't had your experience okay, it's okay. It's yeah ex- again it's an exper- experience that fades with memory that twists in time but it, it's, sure. it's an experience Definitely. and i think in a way that's what it's all about mm. is uh having the opportunity to experience these things yeah it? sure thing this is gonna go 
Okay. We've had an hour. Excellent. Really? Yeah. Okay. It hits That's the floor, doesn't it? You, you yeah, might come back definitely. to me sometime. Thanks a mil. Cool. My pleasure. I'll just flicker off. Frank. Frank, come on, man. Can I Be Frank is all about capturing real, authentic, unedited conversation.